Top Med Talk. Hello, I'm Desiree Chapel, and this is Top Med Talk. I'm here with Monty Mythen, editor in chief of Top Med Talk. Hello, Monty. How are you? I'm great, Desiree. Thank yeah, you. Good. I'm, well, I'm, I'm having a magical day. Are you having a magical day? Well, Monty is having a magical day, and we are having a magical day in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> that doesn't of, mean that we're at Disney. <laughs> we're, well, we're sort of at Disney. That's we why there's quite often Disney. kids in the background running up and down the corridor, which is cool. Isn't it, it is good. It's good. Not my kids. So <laughs> somebody <laughs> or, else's. Or, or mine, I think. But they, I don't know where they are these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here in Orlando. Uh, for the Spocky 14th Annual Perioperative Medicine Summit. Um, Spocky is the Society of Perioperative Assessment and Quality Improvement, and the Perioperative Medicine Summit is the Society's annual international multidisciplinary meeting. So um, we've had a great meeting so far. It's uh, been wonderful to sit down with a lot of the board of directors, um, some of the the, uh, presenters here. And so meeting new people, which has been fantastic. But what's also been wonderful is that we've seen some old friends along the way. And we had the opportunity to sit down with them. And we have one of our friends of the Top Med Talk family, uh, Dr. Elena Kepke. She's the anesthesiologist at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. She's also the assistant professor at USF, University of South Florida. Um, Elena was, last time that you were sitting down with us, you were not working, right? Well, you were kind of working, but you were in a a fellowship, right? This is a uh, fellowship uh, with some faculty days at Duke. Um, I was one of the inaugural perioperative medicine fellows there. Um, so you're the f- one of the first grads, right? <laughs> yes, first grad in that type of perioperative medicine fellowship in the United States, really. Yeah. Um, previously, a lot of them were based on business, and now it's kind of moving towards the um, perioperative uh, quality and outcomes uh, mm-hmm issues more so. Yeah. And how to kind of use that clinically and, and mm-hmm. in practice and not just the business aspect. Of I think yeah. that fellowship is unique because it has a some degree of partnership with our institution, University right. College it's London. It's modeled after yeah. um, <laughs> the University College London um, Perioperative Medicine Fellowship. So uh, just to do a bit of advertising for the fringe <laughs> benefits of being a Duke UCL fellow. <laughs> that you, was. Uh, you've been to London a few times. You can't. Uh, you can't underestimate that benefit. Um, <laughs> just learning um, from that network of people, um, being able to participate in um, the MSc, or mm-hmm. if you you know any of the That's various a master's levels program. It is an yeah. online master's program, um, and we did get to go to London for the EPBOM meetings as well as uh, the cardiopulmonary exercise testing courses. Um, Really just a wealth of information to tap into that we wouldn't have had otherwise here in the States. We heard a lot about CPET today. We have. So it looks as though we reached a tipping point today from the METS trial, where there seemed to be quite a big thumbs up for the fact that CPET has quite a lot to offer. You must want to be one of the very few CPET aware stroke trained individuals in the United States of America. That's yeah. true. I think, I mean, the pulmonary critical care fellows, uh, that route in ICU, they, you know, they, some of them are taught to read it, um, mm-hmm. different reasons. Um, but there's just not, there's very not many of us. Um, so it'd be nice to, um, be able to utilize that as some of our institutions start to accept that as part of the preoperative process. And you went, you went to the course in London. I've just tweeted that they're doing the 20th course that's how is long. it the 20th the 20th I didn't this, know this year the 20th cpet stroke uh-huh. poets course yes and was that how, how long did that take and um that was uh taught by the wonderful dr denny levitt um <laughs> and uh it, it just took a, a few days yeah. um and it is uh it is intensive and uh definitely some new skill to get used to um but I found it very useful, and honestly, I would go again just to yeah. refresh myself. But it's not complicated. It's user-friendly. Yeah? Well, as anesthesia providers in the broadest sense, we've got the heads up that we kind of know the gases in and out bit yeah. and the alveolar exchanges, and we've got the idea of the flow lung the Physiology. Yeah, so we're yeah. kind of well ahead from that perspective. But, you know, I've been around it for a, a long time. Really, you have to uh, do and or see a lot before mm-hmm. you... Hmm. So you can be didactically taught. Just I think it's a bit like say. echo or anything like that. You, you can be didactically taught, but then you need to get a whole load under your belt gotcha. to really start to to look at the nine-panel oh, plot okay. and see it like an EKG. And there were people there that were going right from that course into leading 
that CPET uh, initiative at their um, institutions. Mm -hmm. So, um, because there is so many few experts around in it. Yeah. So it was very useful. Wow, that's cool. We're doing one with the at the uh, John Whittle is going to be talking about CPET at the EBPOM. In Dallas, in yeah, Dallas. there's an introduction to yeah. CPET now, which is when it started off in the UK, it was the sort of half-day workshop introduction to CPET, come along and see one and get over your fear of what it might be like. I, I, the analogies are there then with, with the early days of echo. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen cardiologists going around with echo, could I touch an echo machine? Well, yeah. we've, we've got over that fear of it now. Yeah. So the introduction is very much come and see a test. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it's just cool. Yeah. I want to do it. And the patients get it. The <laughs> patients really get it. Because if you if you do a dobutamine stress echo on a patient, they kind of, I don't really get that. Yeah. Stick them on a, an exercise bike. Boom. And I remember when we were the early days of it, that people would come up to you and say, hey, doc, I'm fitter than I thought I was. Yeah. Or, or you know, dad's not quite as fit as we thought he was. Yeah. You know, so it's very, very tangible. Yeah. What I thought was interesting whenever they were talking um, about CPET is in... in Dominda kind of briefly touched on it, um, but it's like what to do with the results and how do you manage, um, or, you know, what do you do with it? And we talk a lot about like shared decision making. And I know when someone on Top My Talk shared a story about uh, after their CPET test, they were able to, you know, make a decision um, not to have surgery. So it was kind of an indication of that. And so I, I think that's one of the things that we're not talking a lot about yet. I think it, inf- it definitely informs shared decision making. Mm-hmm. There's some, there are some interventions, uh, whether it be starting drugs, stopping drugs, mm-hmm. lifestyle changes that can make you fitter in a very short period of time before surgery. But the very big trials that are currently ongoing are exploiting the window of opportunity that goes with having neoadjuvant chemotherapy in particular before major cancer surgery. And in that window, which results in inevitable delay to surgery because you hope you're shrinking the tumor, you have an intense exercise program. So those trials, are, the pilot results from them look great. They look very, very encouraging. But those big trials are, are ongoing. Many yeah. of them led by Denny Levitt, Mike Grocott, the group. That would be great for my cancer center. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Well, that's I what, work, Elena, yeah. I was going to ask you. Um, so you're working now after you've done this fellowship. Yes. So how has what you took away from, you know, your experience at Duke affecting your practice now are, are you actually you know are you pr- doing mostly anesthesia or are you kind of in the whole perioperative space like what how does that what does that look like I'm in the whole space uh, it's a unique place to practice because the patients um, aren't coming right off the street for a workup um, you know they're being worked up by the hematologists oncologists and the surgeons um, so there's already kind of a team-based approach on these patients some of them are rushed through because it is cancer surgery mm-hmm. um, so I think it um, the shared decision making outlook I, I got from the perioperative medicine fellowship is really important here um, because everyone hears the word cancer and they just want to cut it out and that's the next step and you kind of can pre-op them and just stall the process a little bit and let them really think about what they want from their results you know a year out and um, and see if they're really fit for those types of surgeries because they're large, large surgeries. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's also unique um, just because um, I think it's just nice to work at a place where everyone is basically humbled. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a lot of sick patients. It's hard to walk into the hospital and have a bad day when you see that all around you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How is your experience? Because, I mean, obviously I would assume that you're the only one that's been trained in perioperative medicine uh, you know, specifically, um, how is that filtering to into um, your relationship or and and I guess at your colleagues' practice? I mean, are you, do you have a lot of conversation about that? Or we do, um, and they ask me. I do um, get questions from my colleagues about what I think. Um, not so much just about the pre-op process, um, but uh, if we're doing any protocols, um, trying to do opioid reduced pathways and some of our bigger surgeries. Um, even though these patients are cancer patients, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to be on long-term pain medications mm-hmm. if the surgery is curative. Um, so I get um, a lot of consults about that, um, as well as how to work with the surgeons for that timeline, mm-hmm. like I spoke about. It, it's, a, it's a fine dance um, 
with trying to optimize patients that often have other comorbidities um, and they have cancer mm-hmm. and like un- and trying to convince them that the urgency of the surgery, you know, their outcomes might be better if we wait a little bit and um, actually prime them up for it, which the CPET, coming back to the CPET would be something that huge that we could do. Yeah, it's interesting. It's all very encouraging because it's even some of the preliminary results that signals are strengthening now is that you accelerate tumor shrinkage Mm -hmm. and there's some animal work that supports that observation in humans that if you're doing structured intense exercise programs which are best supervised and delivered in a group environment that you accelerate the tumor shrinkage prior to surgery Uh, that that would be fantastic if that plays out i mean yeah the literature that yeah, they've presented. I agree. I'm actually having um, John Whittle come down to talk in the spring oh, um, <laughs> to the institution to try and kind of put that bug in their ear. So yeah, oh, um, that's great. It that's is the one next thing. advancement in cancer care. So yeah. So I, I couldn't help uh, giggling uh, a little bit in the room earlier on. It sort of sounds as though I'm, uh, although I'm a big fan of North America knocking some of the healthcare <laughs> decisions here. Uh, yeah, they all they should say a lot because about the, the UK. The, and, the, well, I mean, embracing the, uh, the rationale for for North America not resource. embracing cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which is the gold standard test. You took about five pictures of that slide. Well, <laughs> well apparently, it's resources, <laughs> expertise, and the cost. So, uh, the flip side of that is, it seems as though in the United States of America, you don't have any money or experts. Is is that? But we. <laughs> That's we we spend people. more than any that, healthcare system in the country. That's, that's we just in the, in the world, yeah. That's the, that's what that says. The gold says. standard test, but we can't put any resource expertise or. I don't know what they're getting at that. Yeah. But, so. Well, yeah. two things that, that I thought was interesting about that. First of all, you know, they talk about there's people say that the six minute walk test can be a surrogate for um, CPET, or at least you know how that works. But they'll still take resources, expertise, and. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think there's an assumption. I'm always bang on about this. There's an assumption that the six-minute walk test is somehow free. Yeah, I've heard you say this several and, times. And, you know, having tried to get it introduced in the past, it, it's a significant chunk of real estate you have to find. I mean, it might be different in some of the very palatial hospitals I visited in the USA where the corridors are bigger yeah. than our hospitals. Right. Uh, but to find enough space to do a six-minute walk test in your busy outpatient department turned out to be impossible for us. There was nowhere to shut off to allow the people to go up and down. And you do need equipment and someone has to do it. It's just nobody seems to have worked out the cost of doing it. So the default assumption is that it's free. But we don't have to worry about that anymore because although there's a paper in the BJA from the MET study that says that the six-minute walk test is equivalent to CPET for predicting disability-free one-year survival, CPET tests in the UK are not done to predict disability-free one-year survival. They're not. They're done to see the risk of surgery in the broadest sense, and who's going to develop major complications. Mm -hmm. And I think what we got from the presentations today from the lead author of METS was not only is cardiopulmonary exercise testing independently clearly the best predictor of major complications, the six-minute walk test, and and I think that information is impressed at the moment, is not for for complications. So... And it's not done that frequently. Most of the time it's a self-reported interview by the patient. There seems to be this push to say, go for the six-minute walk test because someone thinks that it's cheap and easy. Yeah. Uh, whereas it now, uh, my interpretation of results is, uh, you know, that, that doesn't seem to be the route to pursue. You, you may not go with the CPAT test. You may stick with an, uh, an objective questionnaire mm-hmm. like Duke Activity Status Index. Yeah. But I think if you do want to do objective exercise testing the gold standard as it says is cardiopulmonary exercise yeah. testing one thing i also thought was interesting was the fact that um and am i right when they said that it's cheaper to do or just as cheap to do cpet once you have it as it is to do echoes and we do echoes all day long is that, that, that right? was a throwaway comment oh. in the session which which seemed as though it was well founded and thought through that the CPAT test was less expensive than get them booking an echo in, in the yeah. institution from the presenter who was presenting. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the business cases that we commonly put together in the UK is we won't do those tests that are not helpful, but we will do this test instead. And this test is cheaper than those tests that aren't helpful, yeah. if, if you see what I mean. So yeah. once you eliminate, 
unnecessary stress echoes or, or treadmill tests or lung function tests or just cross them all off yeah. and just do the CPET test. If you just do that, then you've got your value proposition. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, I'm not saying it's a done deal. No. But I'm very, very encouraged that the METS trial, when fully and clearly presented, yeah. appears to support the direction of travel that we've taken in the UK for a, a long, a long yeah. time now. I hope that it keeps the, the word keeps going here mm. in the, the oh, US. We'll, <laughs> we'll, see. we'll be slow We're trying. We're you know, talk. it takes 20, 30 years to get to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> adoption yeah full adoption well having, having, having been exposed it's a loaded question uh, did you think it made intuitive sense and it was pretty cool overall yes I'm, i think you can get so much information um from the cpet test itself um and it's you know relatively l- low risk um and if a patient's going to have a surgery you know that's a similar risk to doing a cpet um T- exercise testing um it just gives us so much more information than any of the tests we currently do um, mm-hmm. a resting echo only gives you so much you know mm-hmm. so, yeah well it's to, to we should be fair there are a number of different cardiopulmonary exercise training courses available mm. around the world which mm. are less in the perioperative space poets which has been referred to that we'll put the link in the show notes is the uk led which i think it's be it's matured most we believe in the uk um, even though the idea came from Australia and the initial training was in the west coast of the USA where it was used by pulmonary evaluations. Um, you can go on the Poets course to get trained up, which is uh, run relatively frequently. It always sells out, but that's a very good place to go for it. And as we said, there are now introductions to CPET and soon we'll be running the first full Poets-led CPET courses in the USA. Just go to the EBPOM where ebpom.org website to, to find all of that. Yeah, that's cool. Well, Elena, thank you so much for sitting down with us. I'm so glad to catch up with you. And uh, uh, maybe next year after, uh, <laughs> didn't you say you're moving next year? Probably? We'll see. We, yeah. It's always up in the air. <laughs> see where you land, but whoever, wherever you do land, I'm, I'm sure you'll you'll do wonderful there and, and take everything that you've learned in your fellowship and maybe start a CPEC clinic there too. <laughs> yeah, right. I ask you, you, came, you came with your husband to our uh, meeting in the, on the west coast of Ireland, was that? Oh, yes, yeah, we did. Dingle. Dingle. Yeah. I highly recommend that. anyone that um, needs uh, some CME credit or just any interest in surgery or perioperative medicine um, to get themselves out there because it, it is just beautiful and a great time of year. Yeah. And your husband's an orthopedic surgeon. He looked like he was really enjoying all of it, <laughs> not only the social side of it, but the meeting. Despite the uh, orthopedic surgery roasts that <laughs> happen daily. Um, you know, they're, they're our specialty that's pretty in tune with the outcomes. And, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, for up. sure. So he, uh, yeah, he enjoyed every part. I would say the surgeons would have a great deal to learn from it. Oh, well. yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> that's funny. You said the roast. <laughs> Of course, orthopedic surgeons, we love you. (laughs) Anyway, um, well, Elena, again, thank you so much for sitting down with us and I hope to catch up with you soon. Great. Thank you. Cheers. Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now all you need to do is find us on social media. We can be friends on Facebook. We can follow each other on Twitter. We can hang out on Instagram or we can even gawp at each other on YouTube. Get onto your social media platform, whichever your favourite is, and you're likely to find Top Med Talk there. Whilst you're at it, make sure you've subscribed to this podcast so you never, ever miss an episode. Helps us enormously if you do that, by the way. And check out the website, topmedtalk.com. On there, you can find the email updates where we update you as to what we're doing each week and whilst you're online whilst you're doing your thing on the internet i highly recommend you download all of the podcasts that we've put out here on top med talk we do an enormous amount of material here a lot of it is incredibly valuable and of course uh, will be in the future so i just recommend you download the entire back catalog if you could helps us out if you do that as well and check out edpom.org forward slash meetings because if you go on there you can find out where we're recording and what we're doing because we go to the big meetings the EBPOM meetings you may have noticed most of our material comes from some of these wonderful conferences that are organized by evidence-based perioperative medicine so EBPOM E-B-P-O-M dot org forward slash meetings get yourself on there and why not check out the Dallas Masters course a perioperative care practicum hopefully I'll see you there